Well, I am just delighted today to have with me a great mentor of mine, Dr. Ronald Keeney. And Ron, we go back a long time. And uh, if I was to say to Sean, who's recording this, how long we go back, Sean would say, but I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> um, and that's a long time. But Ron, you and I go way back uh, to drug discovery and drug development uh, to the Burroughs Welcome Company. And at that particular time, we were working very carefully, methodically, on clinical research of an antiviral compound called acyclovir. And, uh, you know, at that particular time, I thought to myself, uh, science, it, clinical science is amazing, but at the same time, what a breakthrough compound. So I just want to step back a bit and ask you just to, to tell our audience, which is the community college staff, the faculty and the students, a little bit about yourself because you are a very unique person and in the industry at the time, I think you were one of very few people uh, in the world that was actually working from the industry side, doing what you were as a pediatric, pediatric infectious disease expert. Yep, that's right, Russ, and it's uh, it's nice to see you as well. It's uh, I have to say that you are one of the. Whoops, I'm getting a. Let me shut that off. Sorry about that. That's a weather alert. Apparently, we're having flash flooding in the area. Anyway, shall we start again? No, we're good. Just keep going. Um, yeah, you were asking me uh, to give you some background on me. The background on me is that. Um, I grew up in a very small town in Missouri, in the Missouri Ozarks, Bourbon, Missouri, where our high school education was so limited that I went off to college just because it seemed to be the better of the evils that were the lesser of the evils that were available to me to either stay in town and work at a factory or go to work on a farm. And I wanted to get ahead by getting an education. So I went to our local uh, regional college down in southeast Missouri, Cape Girardeau where I encountered um, biology for the first time uh, to any extent and um, enjoyed biology so much that uh, one day my professor of uh, biology stopped me in the hallway and asked me if I'd ever thought about becoming a physician. And I said, no, I'd never thought about that because I thought you had to have a lot of money to become a physician. Medical school is an expensive thing, isn't it? And he said, well, not really, but if you think you might have want to be headed in that direction at some point in time, you should at least take the necessary prerequisites to make sure you qualify for application and admission into medical school, which I did. And um, then I applied for medical school and I got in and uh, went to medical school at the University of Missouri, where I got interested in pediatrics. And um, then I went off to University of Michigan for my pediatric um, residency program where I became interested in uh, infectious diseases because of the fact that so many of the children who are having the most uh, acute and rapidly progressive disease <laughs> would, uh, would usually be an infectious disease of one sort or another. And of course, we were getting the unusual ones referred to the University of, of Michigan uh, from the surrounding area. And uh, that got me interested in internal, I mean, in uh, infectious diseases. So I went back to St. Louis Children's Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, where I trained in pediatric infectious diseases. Uh, during that time, of course, that was the middle of the Vietnam War. And so I got conscripted into the Vietnam War at the end of my residency program and um, ended up down at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, where because it's one of the training hospitals in the Army system. I was able to participate in the training of interns and residents and continue to do pediatric infectious disease consulting down there. So as a result, uh, that headed me in the direction of infectious diseases. And interestingly, another bit of serendipity, I think it's important for students to understand that serendipity can have an awful lot to do with the decisions you make and the, the directions you take in your life because it was on rounds one day at the University of uh, Michigan where the guy who was our attending infectious disease expert happened to be a guy who worked at uh, Park Davis and company over across town on Plymouth Road uh, in Ann Arbor. And he just made the casual comment one day on rounds. Uh, we were actually having coffee after rounds, sitting around shooting the bull. And um, he said to us, said, you know, you folks ought to really consider the possibility of a career in the pharmaceutical industry when you finish your training, because there have been some new laws passed, new regulations 
passed that require that we actually do more science than we've ever done before in developing new drugs. This was in 1968, and it was the Kefauver Harris amendments that he was talking about to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act uh, that uh, caused uh, people to be able to to have to prove that it was not only safe, but it was also effective. And so they needed somebody with some scientific background and some ability to understand the biostatistics and all that kind of stuff to uh, to evaluate the data and put together submissions to the FDA to get approvals of drugs now based on these new amendments. So that 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 plus my biology professor's comment on in the hallway one day were two of the serendipitous things that caused that really directed me into infectious diseases and caused me to end up going back to um, Ann Arbor, where I went to work for Park Davis and became involved in the evaluation in humans of the first uh, antiviral drug for herpes viruses that turned out to be safer than the uh, than the diseases we were treating. Ron, you just reminded me of something. You and I both worked for Park Davis, but we also worked for Burroughs Walton. That's right. Did you recall that? I didn't recall the Park Davis part, but I did recall certainly the Burroughs Welcome because that's where we first met when you were up in uh, in Canada running that group of people helping us to evaluate a cyclovir in, in humans across Canada. That's right. And and uh, and so that was fantastic. Um, and that was a great time. And um, Ron, you know, this is 2020. Things have changed. And you know, our students at the college, um, you know, they can be either young people coming through from high school who probably had the same perception that you did, which is, you know, is it possible for me to become a physician or is it possible for me to become a healthcare practitioner of some sort? It, you know, do I, will I be able to afford it? Um, you know, on the other hand, we have people that come back that are slightly older, maybe mm-hmm. in their late 20s, maybe in their early 30s. And there's some technical aspect of the health profession that they might want to do. It might be nursing, it might be uh, phlebotomy, it might be something something different. Um, you know, how how do you see uh, how do you see people uh, thinking about healthcare careers or biotech careers in the year 2020? It's different now than it was when I came through because. Um, of course, a lot of things have changed about how medicine is practiced, how healthcare is delivered. I mean, when I graduated from medical school in 1968 and then uh, became involved in uh, first in teaching uh, pediatric infectious diseases at Southern Illinois University and then having a private practice sort of activity on the side, mostly with um, children of uh, faculty members and uh, nurses and that sort of thing at the hospital. Um, it was pretty much one-on-one. The physician was pretty much in charge of everything, and um, uh, billing was pretty direct from the uh, hospital clinical uh, billing area to directly to the patients and payment back to the uh, uh, hospital clinic um, fund, or, you know, account, whatever, how it was handled, and uh, in such a way that we didn't have so many middlemen as we have now. I mean, there are so many more middlemen now, and the cost of education has changed so much uh, to the extent that um, it makes it a little bit more difficult, but I think that it, it is still a, a highly rewarding emotionally and uh, professionally field to become involved in. I um, mean, if you were talking about older uh, students coming back into the system, I have a granddaughter who's 29, and she just recently decided she wanted to get back into the healthcare professions in some way. So I've been mentoring her in terms of um, learning, taking some of the courses from our local community college, Wake County uh, Community College here in uh, in Wake County, uh, so that she can explore that career track. Uh, she was taking a, uh, a medical terminology course, but um, have, being able to go through her courses with her on a daily basis was a big help to her because I understood the language and she was just in the process of learning it. So it, it was uh, very helpful to be involved in that. But I think, I think the medical um, career tracks that are available to anybody who gets into it are so broad and so varied that uh, you can really branch out into many, many different directions once you begin the process. Ron, um, thank you for that answer, and, and I'm so happy that you're able to 
actually mentor your granddaughter. That's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, and this is the big one, right, Ron? You're a pediatric infectious disease expert with expertise in antiviral drugs. I know you worked on vidaridine, you worked on acyclovir and so forth. So, um, you know, the big question mark for us right now, we're all living in COVID times, yeah. COVID-19 times. So, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, therapies at this particular moment uh, and their development and also vaccines for COVID? Well, it's, I think it's very interesting. I think there's some wonderful science going on right now. If we could get the politics out of the situation, back to uh, much better efficiencies. But uh, the problem, the situation with both the um, antiviral chemotherapeutic approach and the vaccine approach are both uh, blessed with very good science. I mean, the Chinese were Chinese scientists were good in the beginning about um, being quick about. Um, um, defining the code for the virus so that uh, people were, have now, other scientists have now been able to pick up on the information they've provided and rapidly translate it into uh, useful applications. I mean, they've been able to do in a couple or three years' time what would have taken 10 to 15 years in the past. So we're, we're even though it seems to the layperson and to the press that we're moving very slowly, we're really moving at uh, almost lightning pace at getting something out there. I mean, the um, the science that goes into understanding what how this virus um, infects cells and what it does once it's inside the cell in terms of the pen of the um, um, replication and all that kind of stuff. There's so much biochemistry involved in that and so many targets of, uh, of potential therapeutic uh, intervention that it's, uh, it's just a, a good time to be involved in this kind of of research, and there's some fabulous scientists out there doing the work. I mean, people like Tony Fauci, I worked with him. I don't know if you remember him, Russ, but we worked with him back in the uh, uh, days when we were working with acyclovir and vidarabine and uh, zidovudine for HIV, because that was about the time he was coming on board at the NIH to assume the role of uh, director when uh, George Galasso was retiring. But um, just knowing people like Tony Fauci and other people that you hear about on the news all the time from various places. There's still some that are out there doing work that are left over from the days when you and I were actively involved, Russ. And they, I, from the ones I know personally, it's, it's a very high quality of uh, science and um, and integrity. Ron, it's uh, so interesting that you say that because one of the first papers that came out in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, and I'm sure you saw it, had Larry Corey, yeah, well-known old name there, Tony Fauci. Yeah. And probably somebody else's name was on there. And I kept on thinking to myself, that was the acyclovir lineup. That's right. Larry Corey was a fellow at the uh, University of Washington in Seattle when we began our uh, uh, genital herpes studies out there. He was just coming on board working for King Holmes. And King asked me if it would be possible to put Larry in charge of that project. And I said, sure. If you, if you think he's he's good at what he does, then, then I'll take your word for it, King. <laughs> So Ron, thank you for that answer, and thank you for that um, that idea that uh, you know uh, that the virus uh, there's so many targets, and and at the same time, uh, good vaccine development. Let me just um, sit on that for a second because I happen to have found out in our pre-screening that you and I are both on the Moderna vaccine trial. That's right. That's right. And uh, we had different uh, uptake on the on the uh, injections, right? Right, right. I think uh, I think uh, I think we compared notes, and I think clinically, you had no reaction, and I had a slight right. swelling in my arm right. on two occasions, and you had nothing on two occasions, right? right? Absolutely nothing. That's right. No local uh, discomfort, no systemic symptoms whatsoever. And uh, so I'm I'm willing to uh, maybe speculate a little bit that I I could have received the active active vaccine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I'm very excited about the vaccine because, yeah. you know, we heard this week from Pfizer, which was very interesting, and uh, it looks like Moderna will be coming out next week with a statement, yeah. and, uh, and my impression is that uh, since the vaccines use a very similar mechanism, that probably the results will be likely very, very much uh, in the same ballpark, which is great for great for the world. 
Yeah, I think so too. The messenger RNA approach is both both companies are using the messenger RNA approach, and that is the first time in the history of mankind that messenger RNA has been used to uh, induce uh, antibody production by by our immune system. Well, Ron, that's that's um, great. Uh, now, Ron, this is a mentor question, right? We're going to go back because we've started off with mentors, and we really want we you know. You know, it's so great to see you, first of all, you know, virtually. And, uh, you know, I know that we'll be seeing each other in person as as soon as our vaccines kick in and this right. COVID thing is gone. Um, and uh, you and I have a ritual when we see each other. So I look forward to that. But, um, if, you know, for the purposes of these young people coming up, um, you know, I really wanted to emphasize to them how important it is to have somebody who can be around you that can influence you in a very positive way. And we, we heard how you're influencing your granddaughter. Um, so I'd just like you to, to speak to the, um, and, then, and then again, I think earlier in the conversation, I heard about your biology teacher, you know, that was pretty instrumental in, 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 you know, in showing a change in your um, possibilities of what you could do in your career. Can you speak to me about the importance of uh, how a mentor can have a positive effect on a person. Yeah, I'd love to speak to that, uh, Russ, because all of my career I have uh, been a mentor to one person or another. Back when I was um, teaching in medical school, of course, there were there were students who would kind of rise to the surface of the class that was coming through at any given time, and two or three of those selected me to be their mentor and help them through some of the issues that they were trying to work with, and and that was always very rewarding. Then uh, when I was working in the pharmaceutical industry uh, at Burroughs Welcome and then later at Glaxo, I um, had people come to me and, and ask me to be their mentors because they there were certain things they wanted to learn in order to allow their careers to grow, in order to know what how to improve themselves, how to uh, pursue different avenues of, of investigation or education in order to broaden their scope of what they had to offer people and in fact i still do that there's still two young women who i mentor one of whom is a, uh, a, a an epidemiologist down at the university of alabama in birmingham she was three years old when i first met her but as she grew up she was a friend of my grandson as she grew up and became educated she began asking me questions about how to develop a career and that led to a mentorship that continues to this day and she's just finishing her postdoc uh, work down at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And another young woman who was one of our clinical research uh, associates out at uh, Glaxo uh, continues to be a, a person that I mentor. She also lives down in uh, Birmingham, Alabama at this point in time, but it's been a very rewarding experience from my perspective because it keeps me sharp, but it also um, provides to people who are asking those of us who have been a, around a little bit longer for some um, direction that can help them um, improve the efficiency of how they develop their their career goals and their career track. Yeah, I think we're very blessed to have had uh, mentors in our life, and yeah. it's almost a giving back, isn't it? And you don't, you, you know, you don't do it for any re any reason other than the fact you just love to make sure that other people have the opportunity that you had. Um, and that, you know, you are of great value because of all the accumulation of years of experience and knowledge. And that's something when a young person is coming up, um, they don't know what they're heading into. And, it's, and, and we can yeah. act a little bit as a pathway, right? Yeah, yeah, I can remember when I was first leaving Bourbon High School to go off to Southeast Missouri State College in those days. It's now university. I hadn't the foggiest notion what I was going to do with either the education or what kind of a career track to develop. I mean, the, the person who impressed me the most in my high school was my math teacher. So I went to college thinking I'd become a math major. But then I got introduced to biology and learned that I loved the biology of life. And that led me into medicine. And that's, um, I mean, just, it's just made a huge difference in my, uh, in my ability to develop a career to do what I've wanted to do. I mean, it's been more like I've been in, on vacation all my life instead of being in a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It, it's so exciting. And every day you get up and even, you know, I'm thinking, Ron, COVID has been a, you know, just a, a terrible time. And, you know, from a point of view of um, uh, socialization and people unfortunately succumb to the succumb to the illness and so forth 
But the but the interesting thing behind COVID has been the uptick and the ramp up of science. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the amount of science and actually good science that's going on now is just incredible. And mm -hmm. the collaboration that we're seeing between uh, the members of industry in order to make sure that these either the vaccines and or the therapies are developed quickly, but at the same time safely is mm -hmm. quite amazing. And it's amazing for you and I, I guess for you and I, I mean, we get up every day and the life, life changes every day when we hear about, you know, this vaccine or that vaccine or um, that there are, I, I, I think I heard from the bio organization that there were actually over 750 candidates um, mm -hmm. that are actually looked at right now in terms of therapies, which is just remarkable. Yes, right. um, Ron, um, so, you know, you're, you're a retired um, pediatric infectious disease expert and, a, and a, a corporate person too. I mean, you spent a long time in industry, roughly maybe 30 years in industry? Yeah, I'd say about, I, went, I joined the industry in 73 and left it in 95. Yeah. Even after I, I left in 95, I continued to consult with industry for another 10 years. Yes. Yeah. And and um, and I, um, I I want you to uh, tell us about um, you. I think you really articulated really nicely about the fact that you t to this very day are mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, but also I was. I found out last year when we were speaking that you actually have a foundation. Could you could you speak yeah. to us about your foundation? Yeah, back as a pediatrician, one of the things I got interested in, actually as a, um, my first rotation in medical school was on pediatrics. And one of the first patients that I got, you know, when, when you're a student, you get patients sent up to the unit that come from through the emergency department or through the admissions somehow or another. And if you're the next one in line to get one, you're the one who uh, takes advantage of or takes takes the patient when they come to the unit. And you your responsibility is to take a thorough history, do a thorough evaluation, and then learn as much as you can about that particular problem uh, so that you can uh, um, make a group of students you're with and to your faculty member who's teaching you pediatrics. And one of the kids that I inherited in that manner was a seven-year-old who had been severely abused by her father. and um, it was one of those situations where uh, she was so severely abused that she actually died on the operating table because of the severity of her head injury. But that led me to begin to explore what was happening with regard to the, what we knew about the dynamics of child abuse and the treatment of child abuse and prevention of child abuse and all that sort of thing. And what I learned was that we knew a lot more about how to solve the problem than anybody was practicing. So I decided to uh, become involved in uh, at the local community level in each of the places where I was either in training or in the military or whatever to to organize a community based uh, approach to child abuse uh, prevention projects. And that's that led me to, I guess, a couple of years ago now to set up this foundation through the Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina uh, chapter here in North Carolina, which is a part of the National uh, Prevent Child Abuse. Um, group of out of Chicago, and um, what, what what it does is to set aside a fund to make sure that the people who are doing that kind of work has access to funds they would not otherwise have access to to uh, improve their education, get their work done, solve their problems, whatever. So that's uh, something that I've as I've gotten older and uh, resources have developed to the point where I can uh, afford to give back. I've uh, set up that that uh, foundation with Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina. Ron, I want to thank you for um, doing that, setting up that that sounds like a, a crucial um, organization that that has to be supported because, um, you know, precisely the example that you gave and I know as a pediatric infectious disease person and having had a, a love or a heart for that, you, you must yeah. have seen numerous uh, situations where it just made you shake your head uh, and, and wonder why. Uh, yeah. So I, I really um, applaud you for your efforts in that. And uh, you uh, at the back end of this um, video, would it be all right to put the website link to your foundation? Oh, sure. I'll, I'll have to send that to you right here in front we'll get of it. You. We'll get it from you. But if you're in agreement, that would be great. Yeah, that'd be fine. That'd be great.
Well, Ron Key, I want to thank you for coming and joining us with SciTech today. This has been a wonderful, and of course, for me personally, it's just been uh, over the hill, over the top, as they say, because, you know, we go back a long way. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you for your contribution to drug development, to medicine, and also to humanity. It's, um, it's remarkable. And uh, it's really great to see you. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, judging by what I'm seeing in terms of vaccines and so forth, it, it might not be that long until we can see each other in person again, which would be great. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping for the same, Russ, and thank you very much for that. And if I can return the compliment, I would have to say that uh, among those that I've mentored over the years, you were one of the best. Oh, that's very kind, Ron. You're very, very kind. Thank you, Ron.